What are you afraid of? Financial ruin, natural disaster, death. Dr. David Jeremiah joins me and he's talking about facing down your fears with faith. That's next on Significant Insights. Hello and welcome to Significant Insights. Good to have you with us today. Uh, you know, it's been said that fear is a great equalizer. The millionaire and the pauper who both get a bad doctor's report probably feel the same amounts of fear. And it's not just illness or dying that causes fear. Dr. David Jeremiah, senior pastor of Shadow Mountain Community Church in El Cajon, California, has identified nine major fears that plague people today. He's written about how to overcome them in the book, What Are You Afraid Of? Here's part one of our conversation. This is a book that I'm sure is going to get an incredible amount of readability because we're living in what yeah. could be considered very fearful times. That's exactly right. Uh, even for Christians. You know, the Bible says there's a day when men's hearts will be failing them for fear. And, and I think if we're not in the middle of it, we're on the threshold of it. Well. Did that prompt you? Uh, yeah, and, to in fact, uh, Jerry, I had lots of people tell me how, how they were afraid and the things they were afraid of. And Pastor Jeremiah, what do I do? I still I go to bed at night and I can't go to sleep because I keep thinking about what if this happens? Yeah. What if that happens? Let's establish one thing. Fear is not necessarily bad. God gave us absolutely the mechanism for fear as a fight or flight. It's absolutely true. In fact. Uh, one of the chapters in this book is about fearing God. You know, I want to get to that one because that was a very important one too. Yes, you know, so fear in itself is not bad. I tell that people ask me, is it sinful for Christians to have fear? And I like to say it this way: It's not wrong for you to have fear visit you. It's wrong if you let it move in. When fear gets into your life and it begins to control who you are, so that you're uh, you're prohibited from being. Uh, what God wants you to be, then that, that becomes a sinful thing and you don't want, you don't want that to happen. What, is, what does the Bible say about fear? Well, you know, surprisingly enough, the Bible is, I, I, I like to say to people, the number one exhortation in the Bible is not love one another, it's fear not. Over 300 times in the Bible we are told not to fear it. So you have to realize that Almighty God who gave us this timeless book knew that we would be living in times when we need to hear that. And uh, the word fear and afraid, if you add up the usages of them in the scripture, it's over 800 times. And in the Bible, there are 200 individual people about whom it says they were afraid. And it's not all the bad guys. It's the heroes like Timothy and Paul and Peter and the apostles and Job and all those people. They had fear. In your book, you talk about the fact that uh, most fear is based around a, a might happen scenario. Yes. Not a scenario, not a reality, not an event, but something that could happen and something that could happen in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the basis for the most part? Well, people you know, it, it, what we're really talking about, if that's true, is worry, because fear, fear of what might happen in the future is worry. And, and you go through the list of fears, the nine fears that I created. A lot of people don't have the condition. They have the fear that they might get it. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, I've never been through a disaster, but I've had people come and say to me, I had a mother say to me, every morning when I drop my children off at school, I have this little fear thing that goes through my heart because of all the shootings and all the things that are going, what if something happens to my, ki my kids and I'm not here to help them? Or uh, the next chapter is on the fear of disease. We have people that we know who get sick and if we're not careful, we begin to fear that it could happen to us. And, you know, sooner or later, it does happen to all of us because we have, a, we have the sin disease that ultimately takes us out. Or the fear of debt, that's one of the chapters. We've just gone through all these terrible things. And I know people that uh, were so afraid of losing their money, they couldn't sleep at night. They would hear about these awful stories about 401ks being gone. And, well, we're hearing that today. Yeah, I mean, even today. And yeah. so... It, it wasn't that it was happening to them, it was that they were afraid it could happen to them, and so the fear just takes over in their life. Uh, so some, of the other, some of the other chapters, and I think probably uh, as we go through these, everyone will identify with more than one of them. Yes. Fear of, you just mentioned financial loss, fear of failure, fearing of being alone, fear of rejection, 
fear of major trouble, fear of mental breakdown, mm -hmm. uh, all the stuff we hear about Alzheimer's and, mm -hmm. and uh, things of that sort today, fear of dying, which we just talked about, uh, the fear of God, and I want to get to that one because that's the positive. Mm -hmm. In all of this, that's the one to embrace. That's the one. That's yeah, the right. one that we should be yeah. embracing. But uh, what are the consequences of a person who becomes uh, in bondage? A Christian, I'm talking about, who begins to live in bondage of maybe one fear. A person who is is living in fear of financial failure, mm -hmm. uh, financial loss. What's the consequences? What uh, happens to a person who does that? It's kind of like a spiritual paralysis. Uh, for instance, in the, in the chapter that I wrote on the fear of failure, I tell the story of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who uh, always thought he was going to be the president. And when it came time for him to give his backers the final approval to go ahead and put him in nomination, he waited too long and Kennedy got it. And uh, uh, Robert Sorrow wrote a book about his life and said the reason he did that was because he had grown up in a very wealthy family and during his teenage years his father had gone broke and he went from the most popular student in the school to the, to the brunt of all the jokes. And so when it came time for him to say, okay, I'm going to be president, he was so afraid of failure that he couldn't succeed. That is the pattern of what happens to people in all of the fears. If we're not careful, uh, when something actually hasn't even happened to us, we'll be so afraid that it could that we become paralyzed and we, we basically can't do anything. We become useless uh, to, to, to one another and to God. And, and so uh, the, the byline on this book is facing down your fear with faith. That's what we have to do, all of us, even as Christians. We have to deal with these issues and know, uh, for instance, if we're afraid uh, of failure, God has promised over and over, I will be with you and you will not fail. I will be your partner. Uh, I remember uh, coming to Fort Wayne years ago to start that little church over there and uh, someone got in the house before I was there and put up a sign on the, on the cabinets and it said, God's commandments are God's enablements. In other words, hmm. if he calls you to do it, he will help you do it. That's the key issue. Is a lot of this um, really though about just relationship. Relationship, you, you said it earlier, to have the kind of understanding and to know God mm -hmm. to the point that you really sincerely believe mm -hmm. what He says. You and trust today, Him. today most, well, well, yeah, I'm going to say most Christians, uh, both in the Word and in relationship, are not close enough and don't know Him enough yeah. that they really can trust Him enough yeah. not to have fear? And, and you can't really get to know Him when you're in the midst of a crisis. You, you need to yeah. know Him before the crisis starts and that's what happens to a lot of people. On, on the other hand, sometimes an experience of fear will cause you to understand how desperately you need the Lord and it will draw you closer to Him in that way. But I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think my friend Howard Hendrick says, in many respects, the church today is, you know, a million miles long and a half inch deep. The, 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 the relationships with Christ uh, aren't strong enough for people to really depend on them when they face these fears. And, and when you reach the crisis point, is not the time. No, it's a time to start. But I, I remember a conversation I had with. Uh, uh, with John Ashcroft when the, the night before his inauguration, second term of the Missouri uh, governor. And uh, I, I said to him, uh, I said, you have made a decision not to serve uh, alcohol in the governor's mansion. And he said, no, I didn't make that decision. I said, well, yeah, you did. He said, well, no, I didn't. And I said, are you going to serve alcohol in the governor's mansion? He said, no, I'm not. But I didn't make that decision. Uh, about the governor's house. He said, when my wife and I married, we sat down and worked out the things that we were going to do and how we were going to live our life. And at that time, we decided we would not serve alcohol in our home. And he said, so the governor's mansion is our home, so mm. we don't serve alcohol. Yeah. So it was, he said, it was preconditioned. Yeah, yeah. preconditioned. And, but he said something that, that I've never forgotten. He said, if you wait until the crisis to make the decision, you will probably make the wrong decision. Absolutely. 
That's it's right. the it's the decisions you have made, and he said, then you manage right. the decisions you have made, and I think that's really what we're talking about here. You know, there's a, I, I love to share these two verses um, from the Old Testament because it perfectly illustrates what you're saying, Jerry. Um, in in Psalm, I think it's 56:3, David says, "Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in God." But Isaiah trumps him. In Isaiah 12, 2, Isaiah says, I will trust in God and not be afraid. Well, wow. David said, whenever I'm afraid, I'll trust in God. Yeah. Isaiah said, I'm gonna trust in God and I'm not gonna be afraid. Before the event, I'm gonna Exactly, trust God. and you know what I got from that was, every day of our lives, we're building our defense against the things that can haunt us if we're not careful. In our relationship with the Lord, as we study His Word, as we get involved in serving Him, as we grow in our confidence in who He is and the trust becomes strong within us, we become more like Isaiah than David. We're building that confidence ahead of time. When we come back, we're going to talk about the one fear that people really don't have enough of, the fear of God. We'll be right back. We don't do ourselves any favors when we automatically say, that the fear of God is just having awe of Him, because it is that, but it's much more. Welcome back. My guest today is Dr. David Jeremiah, pastor, founder, and host of Turning Point, the world's largest syndicated Bible teaching program. He's written the book, What Are You Afraid Of? Facing Down Your Fears with Faith. And in part one, we talked about the negative consequences of fear and how often the Bible instructs us to fear not. But Dr. Jeremiah says there's one fear that should be a part of our daily lives, and that's where we pick up the conversation. Let's go to that last fear, uh, fear of God. Okay. What kind of fear? You know when sure, I a Christian, yeah. Man, when I did that, when I did that chapter, I was kind of embarrassed because as you, as you do what I do, and you get older, sometimes you realize you haven't always given exactly the right answers to questions <laughs> before. And I've always, I've always had people say, "Well, what does it mean to fear God?" And I've always said, "Well, that doesn't mean to be afraid of Him. It means to just have awe for Him." And uh, I began to realize there was a lot more to it than that. In fact, if uh, there's a, there's a principle of interpretation in the Bible called the law of first mention. The first time the word fear is mentioned in the Bible is when uh, Adam and Eve were walking in the garden uh, after they had sinned and God comes down to walk with them and Adam says, and, and I knew you were coming and I was afraid. And I remember writing in the book, uh, he wasn't in awe of God, he was stone cold, cold afraid, afraid of God because he had broken the only thing God told him to do and not to do. So we, we don't do ourselves any favors when we automatically say that the fear of God is just having awe of Him, because it is that, but it's much more. There's, uh, there's awesome dread in God. If you read the Scripture, I mean, just go through the Scriptures sometimes, all of our, our viewers, and write down what happened every time anybody had an almost intimate encounter with God. They fell on their face. Uh, uh, you know, Paul went blind. I mean, every time people meet God, there's an awesome response because of his, of his greatness. I tell the story in this book about a, an author who stood behind uh, Niagara Falls and watched the falls come down right in front of him and he had this awesome fear. Even though he wasn't in danger, it was the fear of the power behind that. So I think uh, when I've traveled over, the, over these last uh, couple of years especially, People have asked me, Dr. Jeremiah, what's wrong with America? And I've been saying this, America has lost her fear of God. We have no fear of God anymore. We used to, uh, when you and I started out, even though people didn't agree with us and they didn't think that we were right, they had a, a respect for our, our convictions. Yeah. And they had a respect for the God that we said we believed. They had a sort of belief in Him, even if they didn't acknowledge Him as we do. And you and I both know that's almost gone now. Well, and we saw, we saw that played out for the first time in American history at the National uh, Democratic yes, Convention. Yes, we did, indeed. Uh, when they, they screamed, in essence, do away with God. Mm -hmm. We don't want right. God to be a part of this. And in my estimation, when that happens, you're teetering on the edge of, of oblivion. 
because there isn't anything left if there's no fear of God. And so in, in this chapter, I try to develop both aspects of this. How, how first of all, we, we fear God because of who He is and what He has done and what He is doing. And then we have awe of God too. We, we stand in awe of Him. He's an, you know, that's where we get the word awesome. He's an awesome God. And, and then at the end of the chapter, I like to point out that the scripture is replete with promises to people who will cultivate within themselves a healthy fear of God. And um, there's nine or ten of those promises at the end of that chapter that he promises that if we fear God, we will, uh, we will live lives that are meaningful, that our children will respect God and for generations to come. And I don't know why we don't talk about that more. It's almost an un, untaught subject. Well, and, and one of the things that I, I have uh, been concerned about is that uh, in our current generation, uh, you hear a lot of talk about uh, bringing God down to our level. Mm -hmm. uh, God is my buddy, you know. Uh, yeah. God is my. A lot of our music has done that. Yeah. Unfortunately. And uh, I, I struggle with that. You know, you and I both have had the opportunity to meet with presidents uh, in the White House and in the Roosevelt Room, and never one time when we met with Ronald Reagan or with George Bush Sr. did I ever uh, have an inclination to say Ronald. Mm -hmm. uh, or to say George, mm -hmm. uh, they were president and there was a certain amount of awe and a certain amount of respect. If that's the case with human leadership, absolutely. Uh, how much right. greater should it be when we're talking about God and God is more than my buddy. Mm -hmm. He is awesome Yes. and I have to keep it in that perspective. And that's part of what we're talking about when we say we have lost the fear of God in our culture. Yeah. We've lost it in many respects in some of our churches. We've lost it in our cultures. It's basically been uh, extricated from our schools. Uh, the, the presence of God and His uh, the stabilizing effect that just His presence in our culture had, and that's, that's being little by little, uh, it's gone. Yeah. And, and I think that's why um, I'm so excited to challenge people to cultivate the fear of God in their lives because if you fear God and you fear Him properly, you will never have to fear. That's the bedrock. Man, absolutely. That's the bedrock. For more information on Dr. David Jeremiah or the book, What Are You Afraid Of? Go to davidjeremiah.org. When we return, Pastor Bill Sy has some final thoughts on what to do with worry. We'll be right back. But how can you avoid worry? One man said, well, I found a solution. He said, I don't worry about anything. And he had all kinds of problems. He said, I have a mountain of credit card debt. My house has gone into foreclosure. My car has been repossessed and I just lost my job, but I'm not worried. Welcome back. You know, I hope our conversation on fear helped ease some of your anxieties. Pastor Bill Sy from the Open Door Christian Church in Nevada, California, adds more to the topic of worry in today's final thoughts. Do you have any worries today? It's pretty hard not to. There are so many things that we can worry about. Our health, our finances, our job, the economy, the world. What do you do? with your anxieties, with your worries. The Bible tells us that anxiety weighs the heart down. And medical people tell us that, that worry is, is related to, to everything from depression to heart disease. Jesus said, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about the clothes you wear, the food you eat. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about your life. But how can you avoid worry? One man said, well, I found a solution. He said, I don't worry about anything. And he had all kinds of problems. He said, I have a mountain of credit card debt. My house has gone into foreclosure. My car has been repossessed and I just lost my job, but I'm not worried. His friend said, what do you mean you're not worried? The man said, I hired a professional worrier, so I don't have to worry about anything. His friend said, how much does it cost to hire a professional worrier? The man said, $1,000 a week. His friend said, how are you going to pay that? 
His friend just shrugged his shoulders. He said, I don't know, that's his worry. So what do you do with your worries? Do you have someone you can give your worries to? Usually what we do is we throw our worries on our friends or maybe we, we carry our worries to ourselves. But the Bible has an interesting solution. It's found in 1 Peter 5, verse 7. This is what it says. Cast your worries or your cares or your anxieties, cast your worries on Him because He cares for you. Cast your worries on Him, on Jesus, because He cares for you. Let's talk for a moment about that word cast. It means more than just to say a prayer. It means more than to say, well, Jesus, uh, this is what my problem is. I give it to you. Literally, cast means to take something and with your hands, forcefully throw it on someone else. And so what Jesus is telling us to do is take our worries, pick them up, and throw them on him. His shoulders are big enough to carry all of our worries and all of our anxieties. There's another place in the Bible, it's in Acts 27, Paul and some others were in a ship and they were afraid that the ship was going to crash. And the Bible says they began to throw things overboard. And then it says in a very interesting verse, in Acts 27 verse 19, it says, we were so fearful of being uh, capsized that we began to throw our tackle overboard. And it says they threw the tackle overboard with their own hands. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you literally to take your worries, take them in your hands, and throw them on Jesus. Don't just tell them to Jesus. Give them to Jesus. Throw them on Jesus. Take them off from yourself and throw them on Him. When you do that, you no longer will be carrying those worries or anxieties. And then you'll say, well, well, what should I do then? I'm so used to clutching my worries to myself. I'm so used to carrying this burden on my shoulders. I'm so used to having my hands full of my problems. What do I do now with these hands? Well, you take these empty hands and you raise them to Jesus and you say, thank you. Thank you, God, that you're carrying all my burdens. Thank you, God. I praise you. I worship you. Here's what I've discovered. That in my heart, there's not room for both worry and worship. When I worship him and praise him, he takes my worries. I've found a professional worrier. It's Jesus. Cast your cares on him. I like what uh, Pastor Sy said. Uh, it's either worship or worry, but you really can't have both. And I think the point he's making is that the more we concentrate on our relationship with Christ and the more we trust Him, the less space there is in our lives for worry. Uh, just a quick little story. I'm, I've always had a fear of heights. And a few years ago, uh, I was uh, going to paint our house. And <clears throat> I went out, set up the ladder, uh, got my paintbrush and my can, and started up the ladder. And I couldn't get to the second level of our house. so. I would have had uh, the lower level painted and the upper level not painted. Um, and I was off the ladder and I was experiencing this fear every time I went up the ladder. And a word came to me, can you trust me on a ladder? And I'd never thought about that before, can you trust me on a ladder? And the Lord just kind of revealed and exposed, showed me all of the times I had trusted God in my life uh, without fear but I couldn't trust Him on a ladder. And I determined something right then. I can trust God on a ladder. I got my paint can, my brush, and I climbed up to the second level and painted the house, and the fear was gone because I realized who God was, and I put the fear in, pers in perspective. Now, I didn't, I didn't do ridiculous things on the ladder, but I got the job done because I was able to trust. Trust takes away fear. God bless you. Thanks for joining with the program. See you next time.